wait for me to call on you or you wave at me and we'll, we'll let you, we'll see what the Lord does there, all right? Micah chapter 6, verse number 8. Did you all find it? Oh, good. Let's stand together and read uh, three verses here, 6, 7, and 8. Micah chapter 6, verses 6, 7, and 8. And the, the word for the night, the word for the afternoon or evening is drift, drift. It says, wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with, uh, with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression and the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? I mean, the, the question that's being addressed here is what exactly does God want? I mean, if I, gave, if I gave any one of these things, it would be a sacrifice. Is that what God's looking for? Verse 8, He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? What does God want from us? What has God looked, looked for, looking for, and will look for? In our today, in our, in our Theology probably is the right word. The theology of the day is, I I can't be bothered with all of that. I'll just give God some money. I'll just give God some something, and I'll do a sacrifice, and and we'll go on. God's not interested in your sacrifice. He's interested in you. And the problem with the way we've kind of been going is we're, we're drifting away from God because we've replaced a relationship with a, a, a service or a duty. And now as long as we... I've had somebody get offended. but I'm not trying to offend you, but this is kind of how we think, I think, is as long as I check the box, as long as I do this thing, and for everybody it's a little different, but as long as I do this, God's okay with me. That is not so. And that has allowed us to drift farther and farther away from what God really wants, which is a relationship. Let's pray. Father, again, (laughs) I pray that you'd help tonight. I pray that you'd minister and meet needs here and uh, those that might be tuning in on YouTube. And I pray that you would bless this service and, and, and just remind us that it's about this relationship. It's not about... Service is great. Doing things is good. And all of those things is fine. That's not really what you're after. You want a relationship with your people and with us as a person. I pray that you'd help us to not drift any farther. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. You know, the truth of the matter is there is so many ways and so many things out there that allow us to drift away from God, and it is, it is a, a tragedy uh, the, the way it is today. And um, just as a, as a thought, how many of you can remember back to? And some of some of you are going to remember this real easy because you're you're there. But you can remember back to your your youth days, your school days, and you remember having a best friend. I mean, you were tight. When something good happened, they were the first person that you told. If you had something bad happen, they were the first person you told. I mean, you had a best, best, best friend. You remember that. Let me see. Don't be shy if you had a best, best, best friend. Somebody that you just confided everything in. All right. For my kids, it's me. I'm their best, best, or their mom, actually. is even a better friend than me. All right, now let, let me see. Let me see. How many of you still have that best, 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 best friend? My wife and I were best, 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 best friends all along, and sometimes it's been a little rough, but we're still there. 
We're still, uh, yeah, I know, I know, we're, you know. But I wasn't even really talking about our spouses. I mean, I'm just saying for the record, we're still in there, all right? But, you know, I, as I was thinking about this, I thought me and Dara, I mean, we go way back to almost the womb, almost the womb. I mean, we met shortly outside of that, but we go back. But, you know, I, here's, here's the thing. When I, I left here in 88, in 1988, you know, that's a long time ago, right? In 1988, I left Perryville. I didn't move back until the year 2000. There were a lot of people. In fact, I grew up here. Uh, you, you, I mean, I, I was teasing earlier about driving through town and people waving at me. A lot of those people do know me. <laughs> they, I mean, they, my, my name has been on the truck for years, so that has helped as well. But, the, you know, a lot of people do know me here, and a lot of people do wave at me here. But I can say this. The friendships that I had in school in my young, my, the first time I was here, didn't survive me not being here. <clears throat> and honestly, and this isn't a negative on, on, on Darren at all, but when, when I moved back here, we kind of connected again, but it, eh, we weren't besties at that point until the Lord brought him and said, now he's your pastor, you have to be his best friend. <laughs> he's, he's required. No, but, it, no, but seriously, seriously, what happened to those best friends? Now, thankfully, <clears throat> well, here's the thing. We have different things in our life, don't we? We have different interests. What do we do? We drifted apart. We drifted apart. That's what happened to our best friends. I mean, everyone in the room who said, I had a best friend in, in, when I was younger, every one of you put your hand down and say, they're no longer my best friend. What happened? You drifted apart. You had families. You had different interests. You had different priorities. You had, I mean, sometimes they got into things that you wouldn't have nothing to do with. Sometimes it was us that got into stuff that they wouldn't have nothing to do with, right? I mean, it could go both ways. I still will see people in town. Uh, I, I had to call one of my, and we weren't close, Robert Furman. Remember Robert? His, his aunt is Mildred McCoy that I announced this morning had passed away that supported us when we were young in the, in the ministry here. Um, I called him. and Hey, Bob, do you remember me? Yeah. And uh, I, I had to tell him about his aunt passing away. Um, and uh, I said, hey, you got my number now. Stay in touch. Let's, let's you know, let's communicate. Uh, but, but the thing is, he's got his life and I got my life. And unless God put, puts you together again, it's, it, I mean, a lot of times it's just gone. Right? And, and it's, sometimes it's sad and it's a tragedy, but... The reality is it's reality. However, that's not supposed to happen with God. That's not supposed to happen with God. Young people, I hope that God is your best friend right now. I hope you know he's, he is, by the way. I'll just say, he is your best friend. There is no better friend. You will never find a better friend than God, right? Right? But what happens to a lot of young people, they not only lose their bestie, they also lose connection with their God. And it's not just going from a young person to an old person that that happens. Sometimes it happens even to the old people. Because priorities change in our life. Ideas change in our life. Sometimes offenses come in our life and we pin those on God. I'm just saying that this thing of drift is a real thing. And God says, here's what I expect. Here's what I want. I, I don't, I, you could sacrifice a thousand rivers of oil and, and, and uh, thousands of rams and give your firstborn. 
But that's not what God's interested in. He's interested in a relationship with you. Uh, he has showed us, you know, what is good. The Lord requires of us to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. God expects to walk with you every step of the way for the rest of your entire life here on earth and then the rest of eternity. He wants to be with you always, never leave you nor forsake you ever. And that's what God wants more than anything. Okay? Um, <clears throat> Sadly, this phenomenon of drift happens with our relationship with God just as well as it does with other people if we're not careful. Now, let, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, it was a little different then because we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Twitter, we didn't have emails, we didn't, I mean, if, if you were, you know, I went from here down to Paducah to college, from, from there I joined the military and, and ended up all over the place and, uh, and, and in Naples before going back to Washington, D.C. Some of those people had no idea where I was, what I was doing, uh, unless they ran into my mom or dad or somewhere or one of my brothers. It was easy to lose contact with them. Friends, I got news for you. You don't have to lose contact with God. He is listening every moment of every day. You don't have to lose contact with him. You don't need email, you don't need Facebook, you don't need anything to stay in communication with God. You need to communicate with Him and you need to let Him communicate with you. That's why it's so important, and you hear me say it so often, read your Bible, pray every day. Why? Because if you don't, you're going to drift apart from God. If, if you haven't begun that habit yet, if you haven't started to read your Bible and pray every day, let me let you know what the, what the problem and the outcome is going to be. You are not going to maintain your relationship with God. You're going to drift away from Him. You're going to find a young man, and he's going to catch your heart, catch your eye, and you're going to drift away from God. I'm just telling you the way it is. You're going to find a young lady. As hard as it is to believe, he's going to find a young lady. <laughs> Beyond that, I mean, look as we go down the row here. I mean, this is, I mean, it gets... Decent fellow. But the thing is, no, really, you're going to grow up and things are going to happen in your life and other interests are going to come in. And the, the real dangerous thing happen, it, that's going to happen is you're going to drift away from God. That's why it is important that we establish these habits and patterns in our lives as soon as possible. Right? Some of us didn't get started until we were older. We already had a lot of distractions and, and problems and things. I mean, some of you, you, you haven't started, you haven't really gotten into that habit yet. Whether you're young or whether you're old, or older anyway, you need to start this communication with God, and you need to continue it and get into a habit of it every single day. Uh, because the, the problem that's going to happen is you're going to drift away from him. And uh, listen, the reality is the world around us is swiftly moving away from God. It's, it's not even a matter of they're just moving away from God. They're swiftly moving away from God. How long, how long do you have to be in the world before, and I'm talking about being out of God's connect, uh, communication and connection, out of church, before you drift far enough away to where it's a long way back. Not very long. You know, every once in a while we hear of a capsized boat on the river. You know, they don't look for that guy where the boat capsized. They, they start looking downstream. Listen, that's, that's where you find Christians as well that have stopped communicating with God. They're downstream. We cannot afford to drift away from God. And at such a time as this, 
You know, I, there is there is noise, there is, there's talk, there's communication going on about what's going on in Ukraine and Russia's involvement. And, and, and could this be what Ezekiel's talking about and what God revealed? Can be, could be, might be. But that's just another indication of how important it is that we maintain our relationship with God and don't allow the drift of the world to catch us up in its eddies. That's a swirl in the river. And that's easily going to happen. That's why we need to stay close to the Lord, in, especially at such a time as this. Let me bring this thought up. Back when I was a youngster, if you needed groceries, the only day you couldn't go shopping was on Sunday. They had what they called the blue law or the Sunday law, which basically said this, unless you're a convenience store selling gas, you're not allowed to be open on Sunday. You know, mom and pop shops could stay open on Sunday, but you couldn't go to Walmart on Sunday. Can you imagine a time like that? How long ago do you think that was? Any, any young people got a guess? How long ago was it was that it was that you couldn't shop on Sunday at Walmart? Anybody got a guess? <laughs> hundred years ago. That is funny, but no, it wasn't a hundred years ago. Yet you couldn't do it a hundred years ago, so technically his right. It, was, it, was, it wasn't even a Walmart back then, but any other? 40 years ago, okay. 15 years ago. She's actually pretty close. It was in the 90s that those laws started falling off the books and being taken off the books. And I know to some of you that sounds like a hundred years ago, but it wasn't. <laughs> that wasn't even a generation ago. And here, here's the thing. I, do I think we're going to get that back? Do I think we're going to? No, we're never going to get that back. Right? Right? It, it, it'll never, it'll never, never go back. I'm not even sure. It's not happening. What will also never get back is the morals that have been lost since then. The respect for God and God's word that has, and, and God's services, God, the church, the, the, all that respect is gone. It's gone on a number of levels and a number of fronts. If you're an employer, it's, you don't have to let your employees, and this is sort of still an exaggeration, you really got to fight as an employee to get off on Sunday. You really, and you might have to take them to court. And you might have to go find a different job to get off on Sunday. If you work at Walmart... Even if they tell you you can do it, you can't do it. I had to fight for you to get off on Sunday. Yeah. Even though they promised her when she started, you can have off on Sunday. Th this afternoon, something happened. I got a phone call. Somebody said, hey, can you come over and help me for a minute? I have a, a technical issue that I need help with. Sure. So I went over, and the person's tax person was there, and they were trying to get documents scanned on their computer so that they could prove to the IRS who they were. And, and in the process of the communication, I said, well, they said, well, if none of this works, we're going to have to tell, them, tell a conference in with them. Uh, that's the other option. We'll just have to call them through the computer, and, and they'll confirm who we are. I said, on Sunday? Yep. He, 
Here's the thing. We are in a time of great drift away from God. It wouldn't take long for you to be out of God's will, out of God's church, and out of touch with God for you to drift so far away from God you'll never find your way home. Y'all saw some of those pictures I showed in Sunday school this morning. Those people are the result of drifting away from God. Probably not them so much as their parents or grandparents. Um, Micah 6, 6 through 8 reveals that God cannot be pleased or appeased with sacrifices uh, of, of stuff. Nothing can take the place of a personal uh, relationship on purpose. Many people and most religions of our day have already replaced a relationship with the sacrifice or sacrifices of various things. And relationship with God, as they refer to it, is about convenience. When God created the Sabbath day, He did it for man, the Bible says. For man. Now, I want you to think about this. This isn't all about Sabbath, Sunday worship. This isn't all about that, but, but it has something to do with it. But just understand this. God created the Sabbath day, the day of rest, for man and limited what man could do on that day, the activities of that day, not because the activities were evil. It's, it was because he didn't want man's life fully consumed by, taken over by, filled by, all that other stuff till, he, till man squeezed God out of every nook, cranny, and hour, minute, second of every day that man had until man no longer had a relationship with God. But that's exactly what's happened. Again, I, we can't go back. We can't retake the ground, at least not on a global scale or a or community scale, or a country scale, the only way we can do this is on an individual scale. You can retake the ground in your life. And that's what we need to do today. Um, if you can turn there, Exodus chapter 16 should be reasonably easy to find that. Certainly easier than Micah, right? Exodus chapter 16, I want you to take notice of verse 23. Exodus 16, verse 23. And it says, And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye shall bake today. Seethe that which ye, sh uh, which ye sh will seethe. And that which remaineth over lay up to you to be kept until morning. Hey, that's God started leftovers. <laughs> Exodus sixteen twenty three is what I just read. He started leftovers. God is good. Verse 24, and they laid it up until morning as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worms therein. Hey, some, I've heard some people say, I would never, ever eat leftovers. Well, you probably shouldn't on Thursday or Friday or Saturday, but man, Sunday is a day for leftovers. You're welcome, wives. You're welcome, right? God did you a huge blessing there. Anyway. And Moses said in verse 25, Eat that today, for today is the Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Now there's a verse for you ladies to use. You're not going to find it 
in the field. Go get you something out of the fridge and warm it up because today is a day of rest. And understand something again. Let me just remind you what I said going into this. God didn't make the Sabbath man for the Sabbath. He made Sabbath for man. It was meant for a purpose in your life and in my life. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verse 23. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark, chapter 2, verse 23. And it came to pass that they went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have you never read what David did when he had need uh, uh, and was hung and hungered? He and they which were with him, how they went into the house of God in the days of Abathar the high priest and did eat the showbread which is not lawful to eat but for the priest and gave also to them which were with him? And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. God made the day of rest for us. Why? So that we wouldn't drift away. So that the world would only have six days of influence over us, not seven. So that we would have an opportunity to come together and be reminded of these things and to be encouraged in these things and to draw near unto our God and to have Him speak to our hearts. Because if we don't, we're liable to abandon ship. I actually was going to show you a Sunday Law poster, which I printed, and it's still at home on my printer. Whatever. There's a whole list of things you cannot do, could not do. It wasn't just shopping at Walmart that was banned. I mean, there was a whole list of things, a litany of things that legality-wise you were not allowed to do. They would fine you if they caught you doing any of those things. But as I said earlier, in the 90s, they changed all that. They, they stopped. They started opening Walmart on Sunday. They used to close, believe it or not, the stores closed on Saturday night, didn't open again until Monday morning. Say, so what if I needed bread? You should have thought of that on Saturday, Friday, Saturday. <laughs> And again, the question is, that my, my thought in, in even mentioning that is this. Has the national morale, the national moral fabric of our society been bettered by this move? Or has it been hindered? Hindered, no doubt, hands down. When the blue laws were stripped away, and by the way, you know, you can't outlaw, you should outlaw ungodliness, but you can't change the people's heart. You can prevent them from doing the deed, or at least you can tell them they can't and find them if they do. And, and here's the other thing. I am for them passing, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm glad that they didn't pass this, this law in, in, the, in the Senate and the House to pass on to the President, because he would have signed it, no doubt, to give abortion rights to everybody unanimously across the United States. I am thankful that they, de that they defeated that on Monday, or th uh, Thursday. I think it was Thursday that that got defeated. But the reality is, making it le legal or illegal isn't the real problem. The real problem is in the hearts of those people that want to kill babies. That's where the real problem's at. 
They don't have enough respect for human life to, to not, you know, you say, well, it's my body and, and, and I don't want this child. Then you should have thought about that about nine months ago. And see, that ties in with other things. I need to say a prayer for our fire department because that's what Sarah ran out to. Um, typically accidents. But anyway, the point is this. Laws cannot, laws aren't going to make you right with God. The Ten Commandments aren't going to make you right with God. You can obey those Ten Commandments to, to the letter of the law and be wrong with God. Because what God really wants is a relationship with you. What does God want? We're told in, in Micah chapter 6 and verse number 8. He that he hath showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Fear the Lord and keep his commandments. Don't allow yourself to be, get caught up in the world and the drift of the world. I'm going to share one more passage with you. You can follow me to Deuteronomy chapter number 10. Deuteronomy chapter number 10, and we're going to, we're going to call it a night right here. Deuteronomy chapter number 10, verse number 12. Parents, I hope that you will instill a relationship with God in your children. You will spend some time with them. introducing them to God, uh, communicating with them about God, uh, that you'll do some devotions with them and, and read a book with them about God, that you will read the scriptures together and pray together regularly uh, and help them develop a relationship with God. Now, I know, it, it, by the way, young people, you can do that uh, it, even if you don't have parents to do that with, you can still do it and should do it especially if you're old enough to understand what I just said. Deuteronomy chapter 10, I sent you there, look at verse 12. He says, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day, for thy good. Notice that they're for thy good, it says. Verse 14, Behold, the heaven and, he and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God, and the earth also and all that therein is. Verse 15, Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked, Circum circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Don't let pride get in your way. Develop that relationship with God. Maintain that relationship with God. Don't allow the pressures of the world, don't allow the, the, the stuff of the world, the activities of the world, the junk of the world to get in the way of this friendship. Because you need him. You may not realize it today, but there will come a time, there's coming a day when you are going to know you need God. I can, I can assure you, it, it, if we could put a microphone in Ukraine right now just about anywhere in the whole country, those people are calling out for God's help. You know the difference between them and, and us, don't you? Time. It's just a matter of time. Read the book of Daniel. Read the book of Revelation. Read the book of Ezekiel. There's coming a time when people are going to cry out everywhere. God, where are you? What's happening? They just happen to be a little closer to the fire than we are. 
Let me pray with you. Father, tonight we are thankful that you are a friend that sticks closer than a brother and that we have the opportunity, the privilege to be your friend and, and allow you to be friends with us. We thank you that you desire that friendship and that relationship. But Father, the drift of the world, the pull of the world, the wickedness in the world is so strong that we often get wrapped up in it and the activities of the world are so busy and abundant that we often get wrapped up in them and get sucked into them and then our relationship with you suffers. I pray that we would not allow it to be so. I pray that you'd work in our hearts, that you'd remind us regularly that, that we must not, we must not skip these times with you. We must not allow the world to encroach on these times with you. We must stay focused on a relationship with you. Well, thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You're going to sing a song. What you got? 314. Let's stand together tonight and sing if you can.